Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jessica Williams and I am the programming manager at the California Historical Society. Welcome to our program, Surf and Rescue, George Freeth and the Birth of California Beach Culture with Patrick Moser. Before we do anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that the California Historical Society is headquartered in San Francisco in the unceded territory of the Ramatush Ohlone. It is our job at CHS not only to remember this fact, but also to make California's rich, complicated, and diverse past a meaningful part of contemporary life. We do this through public programs like this one, through our research library and collections, and by hosting exhibitions. We currently have two exhibitions on view, Chinese Pioneers, Power and Politics in Exclusion Era Photographs, and From the Gold Rush to the Earthquake. Our galleries at 678 Mission Street are open Wednesday through Saturday, so please visit. There are some quick housekeeping matters that we need to attend to before we move on to our program. First, I need to tell you that this program is being recorded and the video will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel or on the past programs page of our website in the next few days. We're delighted to be presenting this program live and we'll be taking questions at the end. Please use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. For any comments or conversations, please use the chat box, also located at the bottom of your screen. We're thrilled to see so many of you here tonight, and it lets us know that you're interested in our programs. Um, we want to continue bringing you these kinds of programming, but we need your help to do so. So in a few moments, we're going to launch a brief poll, and we invite you to answer a few questions. Your participation helps us access important grant funding for programs like this one. This is completely voluntary and anonymous, and the results will not be shared with the audience. I really encourage you to participate. It's just a few multiple choice questions and you'll have about two minutes to answer them. Be sure to hit the submit button at the end of the poll. Okay, we're gonna launch the poll now. Here we go, thank you. All right, thank you very much for participating in our poll. And now to our speaker. I'd like to introduce you all to Patrick Moser. Patrick is a professor of writing at, and French at Drury University in Springfield, Missouri. He is the editor of Pacific Passages, an anthology of surf writing and collaborated with surfing world champion, Sean Thompson on two books, The Code of the Power of I Will and Surfer's Code, 12 Simple Lessons for Writing Through Life. He is the recipient of the Carol Hawk Smith Fellowship in Nonfiction at the Bread Loaf Writers Conference and is currently researching the history of beach culture from 1920 through World War II. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm going to do a little screen share here.
Uh, hi, everyone. As Jessica mentioned, I'm Patrick Moser, and I teach at Drury University in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, I'm so glad uh, to be here, and thanks to Jessica, Francis, Eric, and Aaron for arranging this talk this evening, uh, and thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to listen to uh, George Freeth, or listen to me talk about George Freeth and California beach culture. And I'm gonna give a quick shout out to my family and friends for logging on. Uh, I appreciate all the support. Uh, so I have the pleasure of introducing you to someone who may or may not be familiar to you, a Hawaiian lifeguard and surfer, George Freeth, who is the subject of my new book, Surf and Rescue, George Freeth and the Birth of California Beach Culture. I'll show about 30 photographs that will take about half an hour and hopefully it will give you a sense of Freeth and his time period and why it was important. Uh, and especially the innovations that he made in lifeguarding, some of which continue to influence lifeguarding today. Before I turn to the slides, I wanna give you uh, just a brief explanation about how someone who lives in Springfield, Missouri, ends up writing about California beach culture. I was born and raised in California, uh, but in 1997, my wife Linda got a job offer uh, at Missouri State, what is now Missouri State University. Uh, our son, Miles, was almost three years old, so we followed her, and we've been there ever since. Uh, but writing about uh, California, I think, above all, it just keeps me connected to a place that I miss and that I love. And, and so writing about it, um, I don't know, it's the next best thing to be in there, I guess. Uh, so that's why I write about it. Uh, and uh, why George Freed? Well, uh, I decided to write about him because I just liked his story. I knew a little bit about him and wanted to learn more. Uh, here was this young Hawaiian uh, who came to California and saved lives and essentially adopted California as his second home. But there was a lot that was unknown about him and I wanted to see if I could dig into his life and find out why he was this legendary figure and what had motivated him, not, not just to come to California, uh, but to adopt, uh, basically it uh, became his adopted second home uh, for about a dozen years. Uh, so please sit back and relax, uh, enjoy the photographs, and off we go. Um, Freeth was born in Hawaii, in Waikiki, where he learned many of the water skills that would later form the foundation of his work as a lifeguard, swimming, diving, rowing, uh, and surfing, of course. One of his important accomplishments, as his bathing suit indicates here, was teaching Californians from Los Angeles to San Diego how to swim, a skill that was actually rare at the time. For all of Freed's daring rescues as a lifeguard, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, it was his day-to-day -day work as a swimming instructor that helped so many Californians develop confidence in the water. And as you all know, once you have confidence, you've gone a long way to fighting your fears and to trying out new things. Uh, and for people of the time, that was swimming in the ocean. A solid foundation in swimming was really key for the development of both surfing and lifeguarding. Here we see Freeth as a child. He's nine years old, leaning against his father there in the jailbird outfit, which apparently was uh, the mode for uh, guano managers of the time. Uh, they are on Lyson Island, which sits about 900 miles north of Honolulu. Uh, we can take a quick look at the globe. You can see the Hawaiian Islands there in the middle of the North Pacific on the left. And on the right, that close up, there are the eight Hawaiian Islands in the right corner, and Lyson Island is this little dot right here. Migrating seabirds have landed on that island, hundreds of thousands of them uh, over millennia, and even today, uh, and they leave guano, which is rich in fertilizer. We'll go back to the family. Freed's father was English, and he managed the guano mining operation for four years on the island, uh, and he brought the family there occasionally. As you can see, Fritz's mother was native Hawaiian, a lineage that connected him to the great surfing and rowing traditions of the native Hawaiian people. Fritz brought these skills to California and revolutionized beach culture by changing people's perspective about the beach. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a few moments. Just very briefly, you can see there's his mother, Lizzie, his older brother, oldest brother, Willie. Uh, Charlie is sitting here, his next oldest brother, there's his youngest sister, Dorothy, and an Asian servant. Uh, there's a few of the, I think they're albatross, uh, surrounding them. 
uh, Freeth Sr. built this home. There was nothing else on the island but the birds and some scrub brush uh, there. Uh, you can't really see it that well, but that is the Hawaiian flag. So 1893, this is when a group of American businessmen overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy. The Freeths were not there. And when they returned the following year, uh, the monarchy had turned into a republic with the help of the U.S. Marines. Uh, Freeth swam on this island with his brothers. There is a big lagoon in the center of it. Uh, the uh, north swells slam into that island because there's no protection. So he learned a lot of the skills, uh, both at Waikiki and on Lyson, that he would later bring to California. Freeth actually spent some time in San Francisco as a teenager probably going to a vocational school following in the steps of his two brothers. He competed in various swimming and diving races at Sutro Baths. Adolf Sutro had officially opened the baths in 1896, the culmination of a progressive spirit that sought to bring recreation and education to the general public. He had earned his fortune in the silver mines of Nevada many years before. Like other visionaries that Freeth would encounter the following decade in Southern California, Abbott Kinney in Venice, Henry Huntington in Redondo Beach, Sutro built on a massive scale. And you can see here the Sutro Baths uh, located between Golden Gate Park to the north uh, or to the south and then the entrance to the San Francisco Bay. Uh, the baths covered about three acres and could hold 10,000 people in seven different pools or plunges as they were called back then. The main tank of seawater, uh, and this was all heated seawater pumped in from the ocean, was 275 feet long. Five other smaller tanks had various depths from two to six feet, all steam heated to varying temperatures. There were seven slides, 30 trapeze rings, and a diving board. As you can see here, uh, galleries rose above the pools on three sides, seating thousands of spectators. The arched roof overhead was made of 100,000 feet of stained glass, the entire west wall, also of glass, gave a breathtaking view of the Pacific Ocean. Altogether, the pools held nearly two million gallons of water. The baths were Fries introduction to an environment that would shape both his life and the life of coastal California. They may have been the first place where he saw lifeguards working as a profession. Uh, Sutro baths, like Abbott Kinney's Venice of America and Henry Huntington's Redondo Beach, drew great crowds out to the coast, not just for pleasure and cultural education, but also, of course, as potential property owners. Uh, these are parts of a program that I found in the San Francisco Public Library that advertised how to become healthy, wealthy, and wise. And it was very simple. All you had to do was buy up Sutro's properties. I found Fritz's name uh, in these same programs. Uh, this, this program was from, uh, just after July 4th, 1899, uh, Freeth would have been 15 years old. Uh, these were in the San Francisco Public Library and their special collections. You can see his name here in the 50 yard dash that he won, uh, the 120 yard special for silver medal. He's in a tub race. And then down here, the high diving for boys. Um, Freeth developed the water skills and love of competition here. It would stay with him throughout his life. And oftentimes we think about California beach culture really as originating uh, in the South, especially in the Los Angeles area. Uh, but Sutro Bass was opened up very early. So you have the San Francisco connection to California beach culture that not a lot of people know about. We're gonna jump ahead here uh, about 14 years and that's George Freeth on the left, of course. He's got a surfboard that is the basic template that he would use for the rest of his life about eight feet tall, two feet wide, uh, square, squared off tail and no fin, of course. And he was really a gymnast. So he used a surfboard very much like a diving board and he would do flips on it and twists and turns. Uh, he loved to give exhibitions and really show off for the crowd. He was a great performer and an entertainer. So you have here on the right, there's Jack London, you might recognize him and his wife Charmian. Uh, the popular novelist arrived in Waikiki uh, in 1907. Freeth had moved back there from the mainland by then, and he gave surf, uh, London a surf lesson. 
London wrote about it, of course, and he helped promote the sport for a largely white audience on the mainland. Scholars really see this as an important moment in surf history because this is the period when Native Hawaiians began to be erased out of their own traditions as the sport was promoted on the mainland. London also gave Freeth a boost by including him in the story and Freeth used that connection when he decided to travel to Los Angeles and share surfing with Californians. Freeth first landed at Long Beach near the resort known as the Pike. Uh, electric trolleys brought people out there. This uh, is July 4th, 1902, uh, when the Henry Huntington's electric trolleys, this was their maiden voyage out to Long Beach. So it was about an hour ride directly south of downtown Los Angeles. Obviously, downtown LA is going to get very hot in July. So these trolleys uh, would bring people out to the beach. And they would go out on the pier. You can just see them, how crowded it is uh, there. They can just walk over the water, which was kind of uh, incredible to them at the time. Remember, most people didn't know how to swim. They were afraid of the ocean. And to be able to walk over the ocean and the waves was, uh, was a novel experience. On the left, you have that great pavilion. So they had dances, they had lectures, they had theater, uh, lots of things to bring people out. And you notice also, how people are dressed. This is beachwear circa, you know, 1910, or actually 1902, right? But the, the same beachwear continued uh, for the following decade. Uh, the men are in suits and hats and the women are all in dresses. This is where they were headed. This is just north of that uh, trolley stop. This is the pike, uh, the boardwalk there. Uh, there would have been vending, uh, food, carnival games. There's a roller skating rink. You can see the flags. This is where the bathhouse would be. So the bathhouses and the indoor plunges really anchored these resorts. Uh, here you can see the lifeguard station. That's how we know where the, the bathhouse is over there because the lifeguard station would have been right in front of the bathhouse. So the lifeguards were hired. Remember, there's no municipal lifeguard service in the cities at this time. It was the bathhouses that hired the lifeguards and that's how lifeguarding gets started. In California. So they watched the swimmers, the lifeguards watched the swimmers in the pool, and then uh, in that patch of uh, sand and beach that was right in front of the bathhouse. And you can see all the people crowded down here, down by the lifeguard station. Um, this is May 1907, so this is just a few months before Freeth arrives. Uh, they had a chronic problem of drowning. Uh, basically throughout the season, which was uh, June through September. Uh, the population was basically doubling in Los Angeles County every decade, 500,000 people by 1910. By 1920, there's almost a million. By 1930, there's over 2 million. Uh, and most of these people came to Southern California from the Midwest. So they didn't really understand the ocean. And so you get instances like this, Arthur Custer, who worked for the Pacific Electric Railway, 22 years old, only married seven months. He goes out swimming at Long Beach. If you went north or south of that lifeguard station, you were basically on your own and he drowned right in front of his wife. And basically all people could do at the time was go back to the ocean and wait for the waves to give up their dead. There was no other recourse. Uh, the ocean took bodies away and sometimes you never knew um, where it would, if, if they would ever find the body. This picture is also from that same resort at Long Beach. Uh, we can see why drownings were a chronic problem along the coast at the time. Not only did most people not know how to swim, but the bathing suits were long and heavy. Uh, and when they got wet, they were probably made of wool, especially for women. Notice the two on the far left wringing out their hands. And the suits could easily pull a swimmer down. Notice also the lifeline stretching behind the beachgoers. You can kind of see it uh, going along here. They would have um, tied it to a post here and then to another post mounted on the beach. Uh, so swimmers would, who really didn't know how to swim, would go out and they would grab that rope and they would walk out, which was fine in calm water. But if there was any kind of a swell or large waves, those swimmers could easily get knocked off that rope, uh, pulled down, um, by the waves or, the, or pulled away from the current. 
Freeth arrived in the Los Angeles area in 1907. He was 23 years old and he began giving surfing exhibitions in both Venice and Redondo Beach. Beach resorts were popping up at this time, uh, just like the one at the Pike. All this, the large influx of people, this was a way to bring them out to the coast. Uh, and I'll give you a, a good look. This is the Ocean Park bathhouse uh, up in uh, just north. So along the Santa Monica Bay in between Venice and Santa Monica gives you an idea of the fanciful architecture that they used to bring people out. Uh, so because of Freed's water skills, he was hired to work in these types of bathhouses uh, to help save people. This is inside the Redondo Beach bathhouse where Freeth worked for many years. You can see the slides there. There would have been trapeze rings. There was a shallow end, uh, a deeper end with diving boards. Uh, Freeth would have uh, given exhibitions of diving. You can see the galleries on each side. There would have been thousands of people in there. Uh, he would have jumped from those rafters up on top as well. And he trained young uh, boys and girls to jump from those rafters. There was a guy in Venice named Jake Cox. Uh, and as part of his exhibition uh, to bring people out, he dressed basically in a chicken suit. Uh, it looked like it was all feathers, but it was made of cotton or wool. He would douse himself in kerosene, set himself on fire with a starter's gun, and then leap from the rafters and put himself out in the plunge. Uh, and at one point, that wasn't enough, so he jumped from a helicopter and put himself out into the ocean. So these were the types of things that they did uh, to bring people out into the ocean, uh, out to the resorts. A year after Freeth arrives in Los Angeles, his rescue of seven Japanese fishermen in one afternoon made national headlines and highlighted his contribution to lifeguarding. Rather than assembling a crew and rowing a boat out in storm surf, which was the typical method, Freeth was able to swim out to the fishermen. And most importantly, he started to train other lifeguards to conduct rescues by swimming out to victims as well, which was a more efficient way to save lives, especially along the Santa Monica Bay, where most people got in trouble within, let's say, 100 yards of the beach. He also taught the lifeguards how to surf, which made them better lifeguards because they learned how to navigate waves, currents, and riptides and, and in my mind, by teaching the lifeguards how to surf, this is really that combination of surfing and lifeguarding that forms a foundation of California beach culture. Freed stayed in California about a dozen years altogether. And in that time, he taught men, women, and children how to swim, dive, surf, and row. Um, basically working with kids, and this is the next generation of Californians, would feel much more comfortable, comfortable in the water and have more confidence in the ocean. Uh, he brought a native Hawaiian perspective to California's beaches. And what I mean by that is that, yes, the ocean was dangerous. Yes, you had to respect it. But he taught people that the ocean could, could be the source of a tremendous amount of pleasure as well. Uh, and he gave surf exhibitions to show that and, and gave these kids surf lessons as well. These are the Seaweed Sisters. So Freeth worked with um, young women as well. Uh, young women were not, uh, they, were, they were not allowed to be members of the Amateur Athletic Union. So whenever they competed and Freeth entered them in competitions and he promoted, uh, promoted them as swimmers, um, their records were not kept because they were not allowed to be members. Uh, so Freeth swam with these two young women in Venice as a coach. He competed against them. Uh, and for him, Hawaii has this great tradition of women in aquatic sports, swimming and surfing. So Freeth didn't have the same resistance to training women as swimmers and competitors that many had on the mainland. Uh, he, as I said, he entered them in swim contests, even though the Amateur Athletic Union didn't recognize their achievements uh, because they weren't allowed to be members. And you'll notice that these two young women are wearing men's bathing suits. Uh, not only was it safer because they weren't as heavy, uh, but uh, they would have uh, would allowed them to swim faster as well. Freeth taught uh, young men to play water polo uh, and organized teams in both Venice and Redondo Beach. Water polo was not only interesting because it was a fairly new sport at the time, but the techniques that members used to break holds of opposing players were the same techniques that a lifeguard used to break free from the clutches of a drowning swimmer. 
So Freeth was able to teach life-saving techniques, which he was, uh, while he was playing team sports uh, in these local pools. And here we see a couple covers of Sunset Magazine, the magazine of the West. This one from July, 1911. This one from June, 1912. And this is really a direct connection and influence of Freeth, who had been giving surfing exhibitions for four years by now. So this is really the beginning of California's uh, public and popular image with surfing. Uh, you can see by the covers of these magazines that to be young, to be healthy, and to be stylish, uh, you were surfing in California, especially Southern California. Uh, so that's a moment that stays with California and it's still part of, an important part of California's identity. Here Freeth is with one of his protégés, Ludi Longer, who went on to win a silver medal in the 1920 Olympics. They're showing off another of Freeth's innovations, a real torpedo and tripod stand that would allow a lifeguard to swim the buoy out to a victim, hand them the buoy, and then be reeled in by a second lifeguard on shore. So he would take this buoy. Uh, this buoy was made of metal, weighed about 40 pounds, and you can see it was pointed on both ends, so it looks dangerous to us. And eventually uh, that shape was modified as plastics came in. But at the time, you can imagine when you're trying to save somebody, they would grab hold of you and could pull you down, and then maybe you have two people drowning the lifeguard and the victim. So what Freeth would do is grab this buoy, um, swim it out, and then the victim could grab hold of one end and wouldn't grab, try to grab hold of the lifeguard. And then Freeth would grab hold of the other end of the buoy and that line that was attached to a belt, uh, another lifeguard on shore could, um, could reel them in. Uh, this is the last frame of a, a silent movie made in 1913, the latest in life saving. You can look it up on YouTube. Uh, this is the heroine giving Ludi Longer a kiss. Uh, and Freeth just turned towards the camera. I love his smile there. Uh, this was a Max Sennett film. They had saved her life, so she was thanking him. Uh, Max Sennett made the Keystone Cops and he integrated them in this short film. Uh, so Freeth was there at the beginning of Hollywood as well, but Max Sinnott really focused on this uh, innovation of Freeth's, which was this three-wheeled motorcycle. So remember that tripod stand that he had with the buoy and the reel, well, that was heavy, you couldn't really run it down the beach. So what Freeth did is he took that buoy uh, right here and mounted it on the sidecar, put the reel on the back, and then he could exchange, he extend the range and efficiency of his rescues up and down the coast. I think that's Ludi Longer on the back. And then a victim could be laid out on that medical box right there. Uh, inside the medical box would have been a portable resuscitation device and other supplies. And then you can have multiple lifeguards riding on the motorcycle at the same time. So the film kind of captured that innovation, uh, a little comedy educational short. Freeth gets hired in October 1913 to work at the Los Angeles Athletic Club. Uh, the most prestigious private club in Los Angeles. And he convinces the most famous swimmer in the world at the time, Olympic gold medalist, Hawaiian Duke Kanomoku, to swim for him in Los Angeles, quite the coup to draw him away from Hawaii. Here's uh, Freet sitting there on the side of the pool. There is Duke with his big hands and his big feet. Uh, and Freet basically helped him with two things, uh, his, his turn uh, and his uh, takeoff, his start. So Free, uh, or Duke had these uh, really strong legs, but he wasn't using them to maximum benefit. Uh, so Free worked with him, and sadly, there were no 1960 Olympics, uh, 1916 Olympics uh, because of World War I. Uh, but Duke took that, uh, those skills that Free had worked on him with, and, uh, and he won a gold medal in the 1920 Olympics. Freeth moved down to San Diego in 1916 to be the head swimming instructor at the Los Angeles Rowing Club. This was a similar job that he had held at the Los Angeles Athletic Club, and he did basically all the same things in San Diego that he was doing in Los Angeles. So he taught swimming and diving and rowing and lifeguarding. He was a lifeguard in the pools where he gave lessons. Basically, he's this, and surfing, of course, uh, basically, he's this Johnny Appleseed figure for California beach culture 
and stretching this knowledge and these skills from Los Angeles through Orange County and down into San Diego County. Uh, and so here he's helping introduce another sport, uh, which is aquaplaning in the San Diego Bay. Uh, and he's tan, he's fit, he looks super relaxed. We get a sense of, of his great balance and just how much he enjoyed sports competition and just simply being in the water. Here he is in Ocean Beach introducing his motorcycle rescues to the San Diego area. Uh, and of course, still working with children. Again, this is the next generation of, of California beachgoers. Uh, their parents were probably not so comfortable uh, in the ocean or even on the beach. But with these kids growing up on the beach, people like Freeth teaching them how to swim, dive and surf. Uh, and just here he's hamming it up a little bit. Uh, they just were, uh, they basically are the foundation in the 1920s and 1930s when beach culture really starts to take off. But it really starts with the children. And you can see here, it's got the buoy mounted there. The reel would have been on the back. So Freeth is doing all the things he loves to do. He's 35 years old, he's healthy and fit, he's at the top of his game, uh, giving surfing exhibitions, uh, still wowing the crowds. Uh, World War I is wrapping up in Europe, uh, the global flu pandemic is also coming to an end, <clears throat> but Fritz suddenly gets sick in the final wave of the flu and he dies after spending almost three months in the hospital. He fought it for a number of weeks, he was making a recovery, he was back on his feet and then he caught pneumonia. It went right into his lungs and he passed away. Here Freeth is uh, in the San Diego area the summer before he died, standing alongside uh, Jimmy McIntosh, uh, who he was one of his swimmers that he was also training to be a lifeguard. And the two would do tandem surfing events as well. Uh, but standing along the, alongside the two pieces of equipment that to me are, are the foundation of California beach culture. He's leaning against that surfboard from the San Diego Rowing Club, and then behind them is a lifeguard dory. Uh, and one additional thing, I just love this photograph because uh, you can see that this uh, cool factor that California beach culture has, it's already right there in Freeth in 1918. He's tan, he's fit, he's relaxed, that kind of casual lean against the surfboard. Uh, that sort of demeanor uh, gets carried through all the way through the following decades. And I think it's still with uh, California beach culture today. So uh, that is my brief introduction to George Freeth and the book. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. And I will turn it back over to Jessica now. Thank you so much. It's so fascinating just to hear about this um, this person from history and what an important person he was in um, teaching people how to surf and swim and saving all those lives. It's just, um, it's fascinating to know um, that there really wasn't much, about, uh, you know, much knowledge about swimming and about um, swimming in the ocean before this time. So it just, he really is such an important person in history. Um, so thank you for highlighting his story. Um, it's amazing just to see how far we've come in that hundred or so years uh, and, and all this um, California as we know it today and um, all the knowledge that's out there just from this person, this one person who, who started it all. Um, it looks like we have a couple questions coming in. I, I wanted to encourage the folks in the audience, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A so that we can ask them uh, to Patrick, <clears throat> excuse me, before, uh, before we end the program. It looks like we have a few questions that came in. Um, someone asked if Freeth experienced any racism while he was innovating water sports? Uh, that's a great question. He was uh, light-skinned, as you can see. Uh, so he integrated really well into Southern California, into California in general. Most of the people who moved to, especially to Los Angeles and Southern California, came from the Midwest, so most of them were white. Uh, so he integrated pretty well. There isn't any evidence that um, uh, being Native Hawaiian uh, held him back at all. I think he was proud of being Native Hawaiian. Uh, and he was light enough so that uh, people accepted him. He, uh, I mean, it was a very segregated society at the time. Uh, but again, I think not only was he charismatic, uh, people really embraced him. And that was one of the things that 
uh, really surprised me as I was doing my research. I heard that he was a loner, you know, he never, he was itinerant. Uh, but, you know, when he moved into a community, uh, people were grateful, not only because he saved their kids and taught them <laughs> and saved adults as well, but people really embraced him for his, uh, his charisma uh, and because he was so friendly, he was warm. Uh, and I think being native Hawaiian helped a little bit and made him a little bit exotic. Uh, but again, maybe, uh, I don't know for sure, he, doesn't, he, didn't left, he didn't leave many writings on his own didn't talk about race. So I think it wasn't an issue as far as, as far as I know, unlike, you know, Duke Kanamuku, who was much darker skinned, who had more issues on the mainland, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting when you were describing the um, attractions that they would have in the, in the bathhouses, it sounded very um, circus-like, just very um, interesting. He must have had a lot of charisma to be able to keep people, I mean, I guess he's just doing his tricks, but it seemed very, very lively and um, entertaining. <laughs> Thank you, love to um, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was, I was also curious about. It looks so. You were speaking about the attire, the swimming attire, which was it looks like typical of the men's attire was what what Freeth would wear, and I was curious if that if 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 he was the one to help bring that style in a little to be a little more common. Um, it looks like you had some women who began wearing those bathing suits. Um, but I wondered if um, the style began to change much more after this knowledge came out that you should start wearing lighter clothing. Um, what if it happened immediately in that in that decade? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that Freeth himself was the innovator uh, for men's bathing suits. I do know that he probably encouraged the young women to wear it simply because they would, you know, it would be safer and, and faster for them. Um, so in terms of men's bathing wear, I don't know that he influenced that. I think it was already there. Uh, for women's uh, bathing wear, I think, from what I know, those innovations as they get uh, less and less material on them basically come from two places and that's Waikiki uh, and the South of France. So uh, uh, wealthy women on vacation uh, are more apt to uh, sort of be more experimental in their in their in their bathing suit attire. It's so interesting. Thank you. Um, someone asked, um, did he maintain his connection with Hawaii while he was here in California? He did. He uh, he would write letters. I wish I had some of those letters. There's references to to letter writing. Uh, he stayed in California three years, from 1907 to late 1910, and then he went back to Hawaii for a year. And he worked as a deep sea diver at Pearl Harbor, uh, was there for a year, and then he came back to California after that. And I think uh, the 1912 Olympics were right around the corner before he got here. So I think he was hoping to get into the 1912 Olympics. One thing we didn't really talk about was Freeth in the Amateur Athletic Union. He was banned from both the from competing uh, from both the 1908 and the 1912 Olympics because he was considered to be a professional lifeguard. So he tried himself to get to the Olympics. And then once that didn't work, he uh, turned and became a coach and trained others who did make it to the Olympics. Oh, wow. Um, he seemed to move from job to job after a few years. Do you know why he did this? Uh, a lot of it was economics. Remember that lifeguards, there were no city lifeguards at this time. Uh, and the lifeguards that were hired were only hired during the season. So June through September. So after four months, uh, he would have to try to find another job. Oftentimes I was in the bathhouses as a swim instructor, but he worked uh, in the off season at the telephone company. Uh, he worked at whatever job he could get. He gave private swimming lessons. He worked at, at one point for a hardware store. Uh, so they weren't paid that well. Obviously, you know, there are no benefits or anything at that time. So he moved around because uh, the different offers that he would get. And I think also he just, you know, as the Australians say, he had itchy feet, you know, he liked to move around. So like there was a lot of opportunity for him, um, especially with those bathhouses. It's interesting. <laughs> um, someone commented that those early surfboards look like they weighed a ton. How much do you think they weighed? You know, that's another good question. We often hear that those uh, old, early surfboards were 100 and 200 pounds. And some of the long ones could be, depending on what they were made of. But Fritz boards, uh, again, he used them basically 
uh, as a diving board uh, that he could jump off of. So his were relatively light. So 40 pounds, they would get a few more uh, pounds uh, after they were in the water. There was nothing to prevent the water from soaking in. So they would get waterlogged. Uh, but they didn't weigh all that much, and he could maneuver them pretty well. Um, the next question is, uh, some sources have said that Freeth was a gay man. Does it, do you have any comment on this? Uh, I haven't seen uh, that source in particular. Uh, we can note that Freeth, I haven't found any records of Freeth in any kind of a romantic relationship. Uh, he didn't uh, have any children, as far as we know. He was a true bachelor. Uh, so in terms of his private life, again, he didn't really write about it. Uh, so in terms of uh, his relationships, we just don't really have any information about that. Uh, the next question is, uh, why did the grand bathhouses close down? They seem so magical. Yeah, they were magical. Uh, and the architecture, you can tell, uh, must have been a lot of fun to go there. Uh, but basically, uh, people got more comfortable because of Freeth and others, people got more comfortable swimming in the oceans. So they didn't need these uh, swimming pools right by the ocean. People would just go into the ocean once they learned, you know, how to swim and, and how to judge waves. Oh, someone mentioned Sutro Burndown. That was the, the history of Sutro Baths. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, um, and then someone asked, um, there was a huge beach culture in New Jersey in that area. Is there any connection? So there is, yeah, that's absolutely right. So Freeth traveled around. Um, in 1903, uh, he was in Philadelphia. So his older brother, Charlie, worked as a draftsman in Philadelphia, and Freeth went to visit him. And he did get out to Atlantic City. Uh, so that whole buoy system, uh, that he had in California, he would have seen that in New Jersey. So they already had that. He just brought it to California. He didn't invent it, but he brought it to California. Uh, so he learned uh, diving and swimming there. They had uh, a great beach culture and resorts down there, uh, as many people know. Uh, so he, that would have interested him because of his water skills. Uh, he had an opportunity to give surf exhibitions on the East Coast, uh, but he decided to stay in California. And one of the things, one of the reasons, so he definitely was influenced by that uh, East Coast uh, beach culture. Uh, but one of the reasons why I think he decided to stay in California and not go to the East Coast was that, uh, and, and not move back to Hawaii, for example, I think there was more opportunity for him in California. And I think, or I like to think that he saw a need for his skills. There were so many drownings. It was such a problem up and down the coast that he decided that somebody with his skills, uh, there was a lot of opportunity for him to do good. Uh, someone commented, um, my grandfather's family sailed from Los Angeles, Long Beach to Hawaii on the Matson line in the early 1930s. And my great aunt surfed on the shoulders of Hawaiian surfers. Is that something that happened in California as well? Uh, yes, exactly so. So you're right. Uh, in the 1930s, they had the Waikiki Beach Boys who would put uh, tourists on their shoulders uh, and bring them in. Uh, and that influenced surfers in California. So surfers were visiting uh, Hawaii and Waikiki especially in the early 1930s. This is obviously after Fried's time. But uh, they picked up on that. So in the early 30s, probably by 1931, uh, California surfers at Corona Del Mar in Orange County are riding tandem. So they're putting people on the front of their boards, putting them on their shoulders. Uh, and Hawaii, of course, and Waikiki in particular, uh, is so influential to the development of California beach culture uh, from the time of Freeth, you know, all the way through the 1950s. Um, someone mentioned that Duke kind of kind of monkey coach swimming in San Francisco in the 1930s, I would imagine, did he sort of take over for Freeth after Freeth passed away? And, and, you know, he's very influential, of course, in California beach culture as well. Um, uh, what, what about Duke? What did Duke sort of take that role on? Uh, so Duke, uh, Duke did a lot of things. <laughs> he was such a great ambassador. Uh, so Freeth was in California before Duke 
uh, clearly, but the two were friends uh, throughout uh, as long as Freed lived. Um, again, he coached Duke, uh, they surfed together, uh, they knew each other, they both had grown up in the same area at Waikiki. Uh, and then Duke left California in uh, right uh, when the depression was hitting in 1929 and basically stayed, uh, moved permanently back to Hawaii and became a sheriff and you know, his role as ambassador uh, that we know of him today. So it may be true that uh, Duke did coach. He, he did, was at the Los Angeles Athletic Club. Certainly he would have given people lessons. He took you know, thousands and thousands of pictures of people. He gave surf lessons whenever he could. Uh, Duke was so generous that he, you know, anyone who asked, he would have given them a quick lesson for sure. Wonderful. Uh, we probably have a time for a few more questions. So if anyone else has any more questions I'd like to throw in the chat, feel free. Um, one question was, how do you see the, his the history and your work um, connect with, um, or what, is it relevant to what's going on in the world today? Uh, that's a really good question. If we expand out, um, I think uh, number one, there's obviously the connection of the pandemic. <laughs> Unfortunately, Freeth caught that in 1919. So the things that he experienced and people in that time experienced, we have experienced as well. Uh, at that time, they didn't have antibiotics. So basically, they did what we are doing now, you know, when there's a pandemic. We wore masks, uh, you know, they, they wore masks, they, you know, had good hygiene and they quarantined. So it's really interesting to see after a century of medical marvels, how some things uh, are still, don't change, you know, there's, they're just as effective, the basic things. And more people have died in our current pandemic than died back in 1918, 1919, at least in the United States, uh, many more. Uh, and that was without antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's one thing, the connection that we can make across the whole century. And the other is uh, this idea that, um, you know, Native Hawaiians were sort of erased out of their own history. I see, uh, I think it's important to focus on free as a, you know, as, as a representative of cultural continuity. There was this idea that surfing had died out, that Hawaiians didn't, Native Hawaiians didn't surf anymore, and that it, it took some mainlanders to you know, to kind of renew it. And, and that's just simply not true. Freeth is the one who gave surf lessons to mainlanders uh, and they took over the spotlight, but that cultural continuity among native Hawaiians was with Freeth. He brought it over here uh, to California. So I like to see that sense of, of continuity in native traditions. Um, and there's also, if I could just add one last thing, uh, Sometimes we don't think that one person can make a real impact sometimes, you know, uh, but Freeth did make a huge impact just uh, for the 12 years or nearly 12 years that he was in California. Uh, one person who's dedicated that day in, day out of instruction and just bringing a new perspective. I mean, he did what all true pioneers do in their fields. He changed the way people thought about the beach. Uh, he uh, democratized surfing. People got used to seeing surfers at the beach because of free. So this idea of one person really making a positive impact, um, even a century later, I think that's something to, to keep in mind and to appreciate. Yeah, I wonder what he would think about it now, you know, if he could see, if he could see California today. It's just really quite fantastic, um, that, that legacy that he left uh, for Californians. It's really beautiful. And uh, I mean, I'm, uh, back and forth around Los Angeles. I was uh, surfing up in uh, near Manhattan Beach yesterday morning. And on the beach, there were probably 50 kids, junior lifeguards in a, in a summer training program. Uh, so the lifeguard services that they have in California now, especially Southern California, that's a legacy of free, you know. Uh, this idea of training kids to be lifeguards, it would have been unheard of at the time. Or training women to be lifeguards, you know. If women had been allowed to be lifeguards, he would have trained them. But the system at the time just wasn't, uh, wasn't ready for women to be in those roles, uh, at least in California. So I like to think that California could have had an alternate beach culture history 
if they had followed Freak more, this idea of training women, and he was a person of color himself. Um, but because the, of the way the systems were set up in California, um, women and people of color uh, were not integrated into lifeguarding and therefore not into surfing until you know the 19, mostly, mostly the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, so that's sort of an unfortunate uh, tack that California took. Um, but nowadays when you see all kinds of kids on the beach, you know, even they're probably seven, eight years old training to be lifesavers. It's just, you know, it's just a terrific sight. That's amazing. And just being so comfortable in the ocean at that age. And, um, you know, that's still relevant today that you the ocean hasn't changed. The ocean is still a danger. Uh, we have to learn how to interact with the ocean. So it's really amazing that that's um, happening so young and um, seeing these next generations come up of, of surfers and lifeguards. Um, you know, it makes us feel safer when we go enjoy the beach. <laughs> So, well, thank you so much. I, I think that that's all the questions that we have for now. It was such an interesting talk. A lot of folks have been commenting how wonderful it was to hear um, about George Freeth. And I wanna make sure I go ahead and um, plug the book one more time. This is Surf and Rescue, George Freeth and the Birth of California Beach Culture. We're putting the link in the chat for you all right now. Um, thank you to our audience for being with us today. It was wonderful to have you all. Thank you again, Patrick, for joining us tonight. It was a fabulous talk. Um, and I want to let you all know that we are also carrying this book in our bookstore um, at 678 Mission Street in San Francisco. So if you're nearby, come check it out. Um, and like I said, we will put that link in the chat for you all. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you again. Um, please join us for our next program, um, Elaine Black Yoneda, A California Story with Rachel Schreiber. This event is taking place next Tuesday evening. Um, July 26 at 5 30 p.m. It will also be online via Zoom. So if you're interested in registering, click the link in our website under upcoming events and we'll go ahead and put the link uh, in the chat as well if anyone's interested in that. Um, if you'd like to receive updates about exhibitions and programs, please consider signing up for our newsletter, which you can do so via our website. And if you enjoyed the program, please consider making a donation. Your contribution will help us to continue to collect, share, and honor the diverse stories from throughout our state. And um, we can put that link in the chat as well for the California Historical Society. Thank you again, everyone, and have a good night. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Take care.